First, why do we need psychological science in the first place? The human mind is incredibly intuitive. We make lots of decisions about very complicated things incredibly quickly. For example, if I ask you to tell me how many different left turns you have to take when going from your house to the grocery store, you probably couldn't tell me offhand. But if I put you in a car, you'd have no trouble navigating between place to place. Our ability to process highly complicated material shouldn't be understated. But that intuition uses a variety of mental shortcuts that can often get us into trouble when we're trying to figure out the root causes of things. Intuition can answer lots of questions for us, but it's not perfect. They're often really good first steps, but sometimes they miss the critical pieces to understanding causes. Let me give you a few examples. So what if I told you that a huge body of research, primarily in social psychology, has demonstrated that the old adage that opposites attract is true, that people tend to form relationships and have longer lasting and more enduring relationships with people who hold very different attitudes and opinions than their own, or who are physically different from themselves. Would you find that surprising? Most people say, well sure, we've known that for a long time, opposites attract. However, this just goes to show how intuition and folk wisdom can sometimes lead us astray. In fact, the exact opposite of that is true. A huge body of research indicates that the opposite folk saying, birds of a feather flock together, is more appropriate. That people tend to form longer lasting, more durable relationships with those who are most like themselves. In fact, similarity is one of the strongest predictors of attraction and long-term relationship stability. The joy of folk wisdom is that it can explain any situation. We have lots of these competing sayings that help us make sense of any outcome. What psychological science attempts to do is uncover the real relationships between things. For instance, that birds of a feather tend to flock together. Okay, one more quick example. Let's say you need to hire a contractor for a month and you look up a guy in Uncle Henry's and he comes out and takes a look at your property and says, I tell you what, you're right, this is going to take me about a month, uh, but I'm going to charge you next to nothing. I tell you, you just pay me one penny for the first day and you just double that every day. By the end of the first week, you're paying me 64 cents for that day. Uh, you know, it won't be any problem at all. So should you hire this guy? It sounds like a good deal. Intuitively, you might jump at the chance. However, you probably shouldn't hire him because you'll owe him over five million dollars for the last day. You can see how sometimes these intuitive shortcuts, what sounds good, are exploited by reality. What psychological science attempts to do is help us get around the errors of our own brain when understanding our brain. The psychological science has several empirical goals. And what I mean by empirical is that the knowledge is based on something that's objective, that is, something observable by some other person, and that that objective knowledge is applied toward understanding some specific questions. We typically refer to that objective knowledge in psychology as data. So we collect data to make empirical statements about these four areas in psychological science. The first is that we attempt to describe human thinking, feeling, and behavior. What's happening? The second is that we attempt to explain that human thinking, feeling, and behavior. Why is that happening? This is where we construct some theory about how relationships between variables are constructed and why those relationships exist. Next, we attempt to predict human thinking, feeling, and behavior. What, under what situations and under what circumstances might I observe this same phenomenon again? Finally, we can attempt to control that thinking, feeling, and behavior. How might we increase voting behavior, for instance, or attempt to reduce some negative sensation for a patient? Let me give you an example of an area of research that I'm interested in. I focus on prejudice among religious groups, and one of those groups are non-believers or atheists. So I might undertake a project where I'm attempting to describe, explain, predict, and control a series of behaviors that are prejudiced towards atheists. So I might set out to describe the behavior and I might collect some data on what's happening. Are atheists stigmatized? Are they perceived as a bad group, a negative group, and are people prejudiced towards them? I might try to explain that behavior. 
drawing on social identity theory or socio-functional approaches to prejudice, which we'll talk about in future chapters, I might try to understand the theory behind why people might be prejudiced towards atheists. Based on that theory, I might develop predictions for situations under which people might be most prejudiced towards atheists. I could then test those predictions empirically using correlational or experimental methods like we'll talk about in just a minute and find out under what circumstances prejudice towards atheists is likely. And finally, I can attempt to control that behavior. So I might be motivated to reduce prejudice towards atheists and I could experiment to figure out under what situations we can move that variable around. Even though psychological science as a whole uses the same sets of methods, there are several different perspectives among modern psychologists. Your textbook details the uh, more historical perspectives like behaviorism, gestalt psychology, the original psychoanalysis, uh, but more modern perspectives are what we'll focus on uh, in the course. I've just listed a few modern perspectives here, the ones that I'll draw on most uh, extensively throughout the course. It should be no surprise that the first one I've listed is social and personality psychology. I'm a social psychologist by training, and so this perspective focuses on how the situation influences our attitudes and behaviors, how where we are, what group we're a member of, and which of those groups are salient at the moment, how those sorts of things influence our behavior. We'll spend a whole unit talking about social psychology. Cognitive psychology is something we've talked about a lot already in this first unit because it focuses on the way that we think, the way we remember things, our language, and other mental internal processes. So a cognitive psychologist might be interested in how memories are stored, where they're stored, and how they're recalled. What are some of the processes involved in false and manipulated memories? Finally, the last perspective I've listed is the biological perspective. This perspective, this neuroscientific perspective, is focused on understanding the biological, chemical, and electrical architecture that makes up human thinking, feeling, and behaving. In actuality, these perspectives are often blended. For instance, most people operate at the edge of one of these disciplines. For instance, integrating cognitive approaches to social psychology and looking for the brain regions associated with these social processes. There's an interesting paper recently demonstrating that social pain, being rejected by friends, activates the same part of the brain as physical pain. That required both a social and a neuroscientific approach to understand. These perspectives simply help guide the types of questions that psychologists ask, but we benefit so much when psychologists are willing to work across these disciplinary lines. Regardless of your theoretical perspective, the scientific cycle is at work in psychological science just as it is in any other science. As you're familiar from your other scientific courses, the scientific cycle works first by identifying a question and developing some theory surrounding that question. For instance, as I mentioned earlier, I might be interested in why are people prejudiced towards atheists? I might develop a hypothesis associated with that and then I would design an experiment to test that hypothesis. I would attempt to falsify that hypothesis. I would attempt to collect some data that would disprove that hypothesis. If the data I collect don't support that falsification attempt, that is, I wasn't able to prove that hypothesis false, I might say that my hypothesis is supported and I might refine my theory to help me better explain the phenomenon that I'm interested in. Sometimes I collect data that does effectively falsify my hypothesis. In that case, I have to go back to my theory and reconstruct it with this new understanding to try to explain that phenomenon. Science is a cycle. Every time we develop a theory and we test that theory through some hypothesis, we learn something and we reevaluate that theory based on that new knowledge. Science is iterative. We do it over and over and over again in order to discover the underlying mechanisms of human thinking, feeling, and behavior. I want to take a few moments to discuss two of the primary methods that psychologists use in order to gather empirical data to test their claims. The first, and probably the most common, are correlational methods. Correlational methods allow you to express the relationship between two variables in a mathematical or numerical way. By the relationship between two variables, I mean when I know something about variable 1, what does it tell me about variable 2? In other words, if variable 1 goes up, does variable 2 also tend to go up, or does it tend to go down, or does variable 1 tell me nothing at all? 
about variable two. For example, height and weight are strongly positively correlated. That means if I know something about your height, I know something about your weight. As height goes up, weight tends to go up. And that relationship tends to be pretty strong, such that a very large increase in height, such as one foot, is associated with a very large increase in weight. Height is also strongly correlated with shoe size. But what if I took shoe size and attempted to correlate it with something else, say, IQ? Is your shoe size predictive of your intelligence? No. So knowing something about my shoe size tells me nothing about my IQ. As such, those two variables would have zero correlation. Let me give you a more social example. If I know something about your age, do I know anything about the time you might usually eat dinner? If you've ever been to a restaurant at different times of night, you'll probably notice that the age of the crowd changes over time, and it changes in a consistent way, such that as age goes up, what happens to dining time? It goes down, it gets earlier. So if I know something about your age, say I know you're 72, that might tell me something about what time you choose to eat dinner. Now, you should tell from that example that clearly correlations are not descriptive. That means just because there's a correlation between age and dining time doesn't mean older people don't occasionally eat dinner later. What it means is that on average, Knowing something about your age tells me something about your dining time. What it doesn't tell us, and this is really important, is correlations don't tell us the cause of behavior. For example, in Houston, Texas, murder rates are highly positively correlated with ice cream sales, such that when ice cream sales go up, murder and violent crimes also go up. Is ice cream causing murder? Are people chasing down the ice cream truck and they're so mad that they're out of the Ninja Turtle ice cream that they just stab the next person? No, of course not. What we're seeing there is a third variable being responsible for the cause. As temperature increases, more people are outside, there's more opportunity for violent crime, and of course, there's more opportunity for ice cream. What about this example? In general, 38% of people have a TV in their bedroom, but among people who prefer essay test questions over multiple choice questions, only 20% have a TV in their bedroom. What this means is that there's a correlation between having a TV in your bedroom and the types of questions you prefer on exams. So that means if I know something about whether or not you have a TV in your bedroom, I have some information about whether or not you might prefer a different kind of test. Whether that information is practically valuable or whether or not there's a causal relationship between those variables is really only determinable by a different method, the experiment. So let's think about the experiment. In the experiment, what we attempt to do is isolate a single variable and witness its effect on a different variable. By isolating that single potentially causal variable and controlling everything else, we get an idea of how one variable directly influences another. When we're talking about variables in experiment, we're talking about two different classes of variables. The first one we'll talk about is the independent variable. The independent variable, and you can think of it that way because it's independent of anything else in the experiment, is the cause. It's what the researcher thinks is likely to have the effect on some other variable. The independent variable is decided upon by the researcher and its levels, that is, what is present or what is absent are also decided upon by the researcher. The example that we're going to use for the experiment is to look at pre-highlighted texts. Based on the information in the beginning of your textbook, you might have thought, well, I've always liked pre-highlighted texts in the past because I get a used book and I can tell what's important without having to carefully read all of the details. I can just study what's been highlighted for me before. That's a question that you've identified. So let's address it empirically. The independent variable for this experiment is whether or not a text has been pre-highlighted. We're deciding that that's what we think might have an effect on something else, and so we've decided to select an experimental group where people will use pre-highlighted texts and a control group where people will have un-pre-highlighted texts. We're going to assess the effect of these texts on a dependent variable. 
And since we think that the effect of pre-highlighted texts is on our ability to learn material and to learn what's important, then the dependent variable should be learning or performance in the course. In other words, we'll have an experimental group that uses pre-highlighted texts, a control group that uses blank texts, and we'll compare their different scores on their performance at the end of the course. The experiment is all about control. What I should do in this case is attempt to isolate that independent variable by keeping all of the other things that might vary in this experiment as similar as possible across groups. For example, participants should have the same amount of time with these texts, whether they're in the highlighted or non-highlighted group. They should watch the same videos. They should do everything else the same except for the independent variable. That's called experimental control. However, there are always some variables that we can't control. For instance, differences in people's intelligence. In order to control those uncontrollable variables, we have to use random selection and random assignment. We understand that error, or these traits that are different between people within a population, are randomly distributed among that population. If we sample randomly from the population, we are distributing that error evenly between the two groups, and thus it shouldn't have an effect. For example, if I wanted to know what the ratio of blue and red marbles in this jar is, the most efficient way to do that would be to shake the jar up really good so that the blue and red marbles are as randomly and evenly distributed as possible, then reach in and take out a sample of a considerable size. The ratio that I get from that sample should be the same as the ratio in the jar because the error the differences between the reds and the blues is distributed randomly in the sample. Thus, if I randomly sample from a group of UMaine students, for instance, all of those individual differences should even out across the two groups. So imagine we've done this study. We've collected our data, and half of the people in our class have used pre-highlighted text, while the other half have used blank texts. What do you think happened? Based on the information from the early chapter, I hope you think that the people who had the non-highlighted text actually did better. And in fact, when this study's been done, that's what happened. Those that put the effort into studying and who engage in active learning remembered much more and did much better than those who relied on the pre-highlighted texts. Really, the whole point of this chapter is to drive home the underlying philosophy of any science, but particularly the science of psychology. And that is that empiricism, really at its core, is skepticism. What I mean by that is that when you've put on your scientific hat, you should only trust and believe things that are verifiably, objectively, observably true. You should only believe things for which data can be and has been collected for you to understand. You should demand evidence from people who are making claims about human thinking, feeling, and behavior. And you should be able to look at that data yourself, interpret those data, and understand those data. And by the end of this course, you will be able to do that. Most importantly, scientists of all types should always be open to receiving and interpreting data that's counterintuitive, data that doesn't fit their theory. In fact, those are the moments when we learn the most as scientists, are when we're presented with data that conflicts with our view of the world and we're forced to really radically change our theoretical approach. Those are the leaps forward in science. And so I encourage you to now, in this class, to adopt this critical thinking perspective Demand evidence from the text, demand evidence from our videos, and demand evidence from your colleagues when they make claims about something. Going through the process of providing that evidence will help you really internalize and learn this material.